previously on Battlestar Galactica. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is Brendan, aka Cliff Jumper, and this is my 2004 Mark IV Volkswagen R32, which I have owned since I purchased it new in July of 2004. So today we're going to do a little long-term owner's review from an original owner. I'm going to give you a little walk around the car, tell you about some of the, uh, the adventures of owning this particular car, some of its weird features, and I'm not Doug DeMuro. I've met Doug DeMuro. He's a local guy here in San Diego. I'm not going to do a Doug review. All I'm going to do is share some of my story being one of the original owners of this very special car, and I hope you enjoy it. What makes the Mark IV R32 so special? Well, there, there are a great many things, certainly, and we're going to cover a lot of them in, uh, you know, not an incredible amount of detail, but it is a pretty special car, and there are so many things that add up to what make it so special. Now, a lot of folks will look at it and go, oh, that's a, that's a cute GTI. All right, you know, what, what kind of turbo do you have on it? Not knowing what the significance of these three letters and what that does to really represent this car. So let's start with some of the key features here. And of course the number one key feature that makes it special is right here in the power plant, the R32 motor. This unlike your standard GTI has what was at the time the ultimate iteration of the VR6 motor. It's a narrow engine, 10.5 degree V6 that has one cylinder head. This happens to be a 24 valve version of it that has 3.2 liters of displacement and a high compression motor. It, it also has the Porsche Varia cam system in it with infinitely variable valve timing, which allowed it to have 250 horsepower stock and that's a pretty underrated 250 horsepower if I'm if I'm being honest. Um, Volkswagen rated it at 240 horsepower because across the pond in Europe they had released a version of it that uh, legitimately made 239 horsepower to 241 horsepower. Th this motor first was released in the Beetle RSI with 239 horsepower and then the European version of the R32 had 241. Now it had a smaller throttle body, it had a different cam profile, legitimately did make less power. But when importing this to the United States, Volkswagen took advantage of the fact that they had already federalized this motor in its 250 horsepower form for the Audi TT Mark I, which it did send here with its DSG. Sadly, we didn't get the DSG in the Mark IV platform. Uh, honestly, I really like the flappy paddles. I would have bought this and the VR6 matched with the DSG is, is glorious. It is, it is wonderful. It's unlike the DSG with a four cylinder, which frankly it performs well, but it's boring. Um, totally different experience with the, the VR6, especially with the 3.2. Uh, the automatic blipping of the throttle that the DSG has, it just makes it sound wonderful and, and so much fun. Now, in, uh, in our iteration here, looks like I've got one of my coil packs jumping out. That's probably not good. So just press that down. Interesting. Ignore that. Edit that out later. Uh, anyway, the, the VR6 platform coming here with its six-speed manual transmission were a couple of the key features that made this so special. Of course, we've got these ridiculously bolstered <laughs> seats, the Koenig K5000 seats that this comes with. You see the little uh, Koenig thing here. 
You can see how deep these are just by comparing my hand. I mean, there, there are not very many factory seats that have this much bolstering. The hip bolsters are also super deep. So when you sit in here, even if, if it's the full leather version, you are really planted very well for aggressive, or I should say spirited driving. The R32 also came with a very thick steering wheel with these, these wonderful kind of thumb grips here, a lot thicker than the standard GTI. This has become a very desirable steering wheel for other people to um, upgrade to. They've got like a GTI or another Mark IV. And of course, the all-wheel drive, six-speed transmission. Now, the, there, there are a lot of other smaller special features here. Mine has the European factory navigation. Um, of course, they all came with heated seats here in the U.S. Climatronic, which I love. I've done a few OEM Plus upgrades to mine. I'll, uh, I'll walk through some of them in just a few minutes. But uh, just talking about what the car actually came with when I bought it, did not come with these wheels. I still have my factory wheels. They are on my daughter's car at the moment. Uh, these are TSW Nürburgrings, which I got because they're very lightweight and they're rotary forged, they're very strong. Um, also, the, the black side skirts along the bottom here, these are Maxton design side skirts, did not come with these. These taillights, though, these are out of the Volkswagen accessories catalog of 2004. I'm probably one of the only people who actually ponied up the money to buy these over the factory red and black smoked lights. I've only met one other person who has these particular Volkswagen sport accessory lights. Uh, they weren't cheap, but uh, at the time, I figured they're making this part for the car. I may as well get it while they're still making it because I've had experience in the past with my Corrado. If you don't buy a part while it's being made, you might not get it. The other thing I did back in the day is it came with uh, the standard freeform reflectors. I got the Depot um, E-Code projector lights. They, it's the same company that makes uh, the OEM light for the R32, but these are glass lenses, which I have covered with Laminex. I think I covered that in an early video. They also have a fog light, which I found is really, really useful for an unexpected purpose. You see, when you have eight HIDs, even if they're bi-xenon HIDs, when you flick it to bright, it raises the cutoff line a bit, but the cutoff line is still so low that you can't see street signs. So you're driving along, and you're happy and you're looking for the place you need to turn and it's dark and you've got this very razor sharp cutoff with your HID lights, you can't actually, it's not lighting up the street sign. So if you flick on your fog lights, boom, all of a sudden you can see street lights and you can see stuff illuminated. So it's not really the intended purpose of fog lights, but I found it very useful. And of course, many people have put on the Cupra R front lip. Um, I've painted it black. I've painted my front grills black as well, just to make it easier to maintain. I have replaced the side markers with uh, the black smoked ones, just kind of this black and blue theme that I have going. And by the way, I apologize, my engine is super dirty. I drove out this morning to Cars and Coffee. It was a very spirited drive, got a lot of dust under here, and I, I just didn't wipe it up before I did this. But it's a real world daily driver. I bought this in 2004 to be my daily driver. And the deal that I made with my wife was that when I got this car, I was not allowed to modify it. I had to be happy with it the way it was stock. And of course, the first time I drove it and uh, saw all of these features, oh, it already comes with sport pedals, it already comes with a short shifted six speed transmission, it's got all this nice power and features. Um, I really didn't feel like I needed to modify anything. No, I, I did, little by little. Little cosmetic things, little OEM plus things. And, um, and over the years, it's, it's really become a, a, a pretty good expression of my own personal tastes in the car. But I try to keep it as a very well-maintained factory version of this car. Of course, we would, we would be neglectful in reviewing the owner experience if we didn't talk about the amazing factory exhaust that this came with it. It's got a, uh, a dual exhaust out the back. and there's a flapper system um, underneath here, which in factory mode, what it will do is when you're operating at low speeds, 
it keeps the flapper closed and all the sound goes through the muffler and it keeps it pretty subdued. And then at a certain RPM, it opens the flapper, which bypasses the muffler and you've got straight out, uh, straight exhaust and it's, it's considerably louder. Um, back in the day, one of the people in our owner's forum, actually, I, I'm not even going to say our forum, the TT forum, the Audi TT forum that had the 3.2, they figured out that there was a wire back here in the kick panel that you could splice into and be able to wire in your own manual switch, which I have placed right here. So I can choose stock mode and the computer controls how loud or how quiet it is. I can put it in um, loud all the time, which is where I usually leave it, or I can hit this, I call it date night mode, and it's quiet all the time, regardless of RPM or throttle position. And I can just manually do this. Um, I've also wired in a USB for my phone right here, keep, keep this all tucked away. And um, in the R32, they did not put the typical Mark IV cup holder because we have cup holders in the center console down here underneath the armrest which also a lot of uh, R32s did not come with this armrest. I, I added this but it is a factory armrest and it's you know it's, it's nice to be able to just kind of put your arm down here and and shift. It reminds me a bit of uh, the 944 that I used to drive that belonged to my buddy. Um, just your, your arm felt right at home here on the console, just fell into place for the shifter, very comfortable. Obviously, being a hatchback, this has got a lot of utility to it. It's one of the reasons I was attracted to the car. Now, these great big um, Koenig seats have an interesting way of flipping forward. You pull the latch forward, get this forward so it doesn't break your sun visors, and then the whole bottom rotates back and forth. I'm going to come put my leg under there, but you can see how that whole thing just pivots to get you forward and that gives you enough room to get into the leather back seat. So you know, there's leather everywhere. It uh, reminds me a little bit of the Corrado with the amount of leather. I have swapped out my original headrests for headrests from a, uh, I think they're from a B4 Passat because they're smaller. The stock ones like literally stuck up so high they blocked your entire rear window view. I kept them because I want to keep all my original stuff, but you see I've also swapped out my interior lights for red LED and uh, I've saved my original floor mats, but I've put in these, these blue sport mats that match the car a lot better in terms of the color. I also have monster mats for the car. So there's, there are a few features that I've put in here just to enhance, you know, we've got my Ooh, Valentine one, of course, mounted up here on the ceiling. Hard mount, and uh, we've got the display here in the cluster. The screen has been modified by Matthew Litke. He does these in batches. You send out your cluster to him, and he will remove the factory failing LCD red pixelated thing that's not working anymore, and he puts in this full color deal which gives you access to so many different multifunctions. This is one of the little OEM plus modifications. It brings the car really into a far more recent um, age range in terms of all the functions and features and the, the computer and you know trip computer and all that fun stuff. But it's a great little feature. And then we have here the factory navigation from 2004, which is, um, you know, Kind of clunky if I'm being real. So you can you can zoom in pretty tight. All right, there's my 2D representation of where we're at. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit, and if I want to zoom out a whole lot, it will. Um, let's take a look at the area. So it's gonna think about it because this is DVD based, and yeah, there we go. Kind of the general area that we're at, and and not not a whole lot of of detail. And because it is disc based, I have to update the discs every so often, which is not the most convenient. So most of the time, if I'm being real, I just end up using my app based navigation. I use Waze on my iPhone, 
but this is actually really helpful for when you get into areas where there is no cell phone reception you still have GPS satellite reception and this has been useful on quite a few road trips when there was nothing there was no cell phone and um, and even though it's 2004 vintage info it's not a touch screen it does angle around the screen that's that's kind of a cool little feature so even though it's down in the dash you can have a good viewing angle of it just a nice little feature but you know it's it's just it's an old touch for uh for a, a car that's aging and of course we should talk about the exhaust note <laughs> Certainly the, the grunt and the growl and the wookie noise, as, as it's been described of the R32, is part of its very special nature. Yes, we call these wookies. For those of you who are you wondering about that, you may have seen us call uh, one of our big events, Wookies in the Woods. There's a, a Southern California based uh, and now spread to the entire West Coast based called a uh, club called West Coast Wookies. And, uh, and it's all R32s and, and Golf R models, but the, the original Wookiee, of course, was the VR6 Corrado. And the reason we call it that is because under acceleration, which I'll show you on the freeway when you're under load, it sounds like Chewbacca going <laughs> So it's a Wookiee. And of course, what would be an owner's review on a car without actually driving the car? So. Let's spend a little bit of time. Before I get out on public roads and uh, drive like a hooligan, uh, we, we live on a fairly large property in East County. So I can drive a little bit like a hooligan right here before we go, so let's enjoy that. That noise, that's part of the charm. That's part of won me over to buying this car in the first place. Now, let's set the way back machine to 2004, shall we? Back in 2004, I was looking to buy a new car. At the time, I had a G60 Corrado and it broke all the time because I had modified the snot out of it and I had modified the reliability out of it completely. So my wife, being very tired of rescuing me from the side of the freeway, gave me an ultimatum and said, honey, you are going to buy a new car. It is going to have a warranty. It is going to have 24 hour roadside assistance and I'm not rescuing you anymore. So go buy a new car. And, and by the way, you're not allowed to modify it. There weren't a lot of cars that fit the bill back in 2004 that I would be happy with unmodified. Among them were the WRX, the STI, the Evo, and the STI and the Evo were just a little out of my price range at the time. The R32 was pretty, well, was also brand new because it's a one year limited edition thing and the demand was really high when they first came out and they were fetching prices of 40, 45,000, even $50,000 for people who wanted to get in the door with an R32 in January or February of 2004. And that was just ridiculous. I was not paying that much money for a Golf, no matter what its features were. So to be honest, I was not a believer at first. I was kind of a Golf R32 hater. And I was gonna buy a Mini Cooper S. Fortunately, one of my friends who works at Volkswagen uh, got a wind of my plans and said, you know what, you owe it to yourself to at least drive an R32 before you make a decision like that. Fair enough. So. To the dealer I went, she took me for a test drive, and by the way, she was a race car driver. So when we went for a test drive, actually what happened is, I just said, you drive me around and show me what it will do, because I know you're pretty skilled. So she gave me a whirlwind test drive around Mount Helix here in San Diego, and I didn't even drive the car. I just said, okay, let's go back to the dealership and do paperwork, I'm ready to buy it. And she said, no, 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 you can't buy the car without even having driven it. So she made me drive it back to the dealership. Of course, it was a wonderful experience. 
pardon me while I put my sunglasses on. I know some people hate sunglasses in these videos, but the sun is setting and I need to be safe. Anyway, we went back to the dealership. I bought it and it was just that perfect time of the year, July. Car sales were in a slump. There were like 15 R32s sitting on the lot, brand new, unsold. And I asked her, hey, how much money do you need to make off of me? And she said, nothing. Volkswagen's gonna give me like a thousand bucks just for getting one of them off the lot. So we can sell it to you at invoice. $27,500 is what I paid for this car, brand new in, our, in 2004, in July. And um, <laughs> I don't regret that investment at all. I came driving home and I called my wife and said, hey honey, I'm not buying a Mini Cooper. I've decided to get a Volkswagen Golf. And she said, are you sure? Are you going to be happy with a Golf? You know, the Mini Cooper is at least a little sporty. Uh, I know you like those little little European cars. And I said, I, I think I'll be okay with the Golf. And I came pulling into the parking lot with this and she went, oh, that Golf. And so this was that Golf for a while. And um, yeah, 250 horsepower, all wheel drive, driving like a hooligan. It was wonderful. And I've enjoyed really every moment of it. Yeah, I, I call this experience the smile maker because it's really, it's hard to get in behind the wheel and not have a smile on your face in this car. It just, it's exciting, it's fun, it's special. People who know what the car is give you the thumbs up and people who don't just assume it's a cute little Volkswagen and and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm really okay with the unass uh, unassuming thing where you go, oh, just a cute little Volkswagen Golf, whatever, and then um, I'm enjoying it because really, for me, driving is not about what other people think about the car. It's how the car affects me and makes me feel. Do I enjoy the experience as a driver? And man, with these seats and just the right amount of power, it's enough to get you in trouble, but it's not some overwhelming 600 horsepower Nissan GTR or something crazy like that. It's enough. It's enough to make you happy it's it's great fun in the snow it's great fun in the rain it's great fun in really any weather and you know the sunroof moonroof combination and the leather there's enough luxury feel to it to really enjoy it and of course the european car community and the enthusiasts and video game community because let's not forget this was the starting car in forza motorsport and gran turismo getting on the freeway. This was the starting car. Anyway, that <laughs> I love that noise. And and a lot of people got to know this car from the video games. And when they see one in real life, you know, for a long time when it was brand new, people go, oh my gosh, is that a real R32? Because there were folks who were getting their GTIs and decking them out in R32 bodywork. Uh, there was another special thing about the car. They put a special bumper on it, special side skirts, special rear bumper to fit the dual exhaust. So it was just a little bit different looking than the regular GTI in Golf. Uh, the interior has got some special stuff too, like the dash is different than the regular Golf dash. It's got this weird dimpled texture to it where you would have smooth texture on anything else. And as it has been described to me by the people that used to be called uh, the Moonraker Project at Volkswagen, and now I think they're just called Volkswagen Racing, they're the ones who were responsible for putting this together really as a parts bin car. You know, it's got an Audi TT drivetrain, suspension, and chassis with you know, essentially the same motor that's dropped in the Porsche Cayenne SUV of that day with a golf body dropped onto it and then these racing seats. I mean, what's not to love? It's, it's cut it all. Uh, and of course, you know, over time, over time, I've customized it with just a few OEM plus mods. Like, you know, I mentioned the, the factory navigation and the cluster, little things, LED interior. Uh, at some point in time, the factory suspension was worn out. The factory shocks were made by Monroe for the US spec car. And they had a habit of wearing out at about 25,000 miles, which was still under warranty. So I convinced 
my uh, tech guys at the dealership to replace them under warranty with the factory part number for the European parts. So now I have the H&Rs and Bilsteins tuned by Volkswagen Motorsport for the European R32. So it's a different suspension setup than the American setup, which was pretty soft, if I'm being real. This is a little bit firmer, but again, um, just playing by the rules. It was a factory part for a factory part, and it certainly did the job. As my brakes wore out uh, at about 60,000 miles, I replaced the brake rotors with some cross-drilled and slotted models. And I was tracking the car quite a bit at that time. I will say this, the factory brakes were more than adequate for any street driving I was doing. And most track sessions, I could get about 17, maybe 18 minutes into a 20 minute track session before I began to experience any brake fading. And at that point, you're really, you're supposed to be going into your cool down laps anyway, so it wasn't a deal breaker. I'm gonna put this into quieter mode to talk. Uh, there we go. So, um, you know, putting on the cross-drilled and slotted rotors, it, it gave me that maybe one half of a tenth of a percent that I needed to be able to track the car and, uh, and not feel like I was in any danger of losing my braking ability due to brake fading. Um, incidentally, uh, for street driving, I use the OEM pageant pads on the car. When tracking, I use Hawk HPS or HPS Plus because uh, they, they, they sit, tend to work better under track conditions, but they take a long time to warm up. They don't have any initial bite to them. And the Paget pads have wonderful initial bites. So, you know, you're in traffic, you need to brake suddenly, the brakes are gonna work, and they, they work. They really work. The brakes on this car are awesome. Uh, if I recall, the 60 to zero spec time for this factory was 108 feet which is supercar territory for braking. And what the, the Moonraker people told me was, they took the brakes off of a BMW 750IL and put them on here. So they're great big two piston calipers. They're not the four pistons that we had hoped for, but two pistons off of a giant land yacht from Germany and they work really well on this little itty bitty car. The driving characteristics and feel for the car are also a, a huge, I don't know, they're just part of what makes it so special. It feels different. The all-wheel drive system gives you a lot more confidence in cornering and in inclement weather conditions. If you drive it in rain or snow, I, I drove it in the snow in the Midwest for a couple of years. I had put the factory steel skid plate on to protect the soft aluminum oil pan that this has and i was able to drive with confidence through ice and snow and it had a great time it was wonderful now as as being a 16 year old car it's aged it's not brand new it's certainly its performance specs are not going to keep up with the modern golf r or the modern sti or even the modern like probably a regular impreza at this point probably has more power i haven't looked at the specs but uh, 250 horsepower and mine is lightly modified i've got a different set of software programming i've got the giac flash loader so i can switch a few programs i've got an intake i've got a couple of small exhaust mods and all in all um, that that's added about 30 horsepower to my power output verified on a dyno, so I'm not just throwing numbers out there, started off with 214 horsepower at the wheels. It currently has 248 horsepower at the wheels, so you can do the math yourself. But that kind of power is still not what I would consider competitive for modern cars, but it's not bad. It's still, it's enough to put a smile on your face. It's a lot of fun. It's great on the twisty roads. It's still competitive on the track. I can go on the track and because I've got experience and I know what I can push the car to do, I can have fun and I can 
be competitive with a wide variety of other cars that really should kind of leave me in the dust. But let's be honest, uh, when you're pushing a car at eight tenths, nine tenths, really 10 tenths of what it can do, it's a driver's game, not just the car. And I have had my butt handed to me by guys who have 20 more years track experience than I have. And these guys are driving like a 90 horsepower Mark One GTI. And I'm okay with that. Experienced drivers are always gonna win. Uh, what do they say? Old age and treachery will always dominate youth and skill. Yeah, probably true. But at the end of the day, this is this is a great car. I love it. I've loved every minute of owning it. I plan to drive it into the ground. Both of my kids ask me, am I gonna get to drive this car someday? Well, okay, kids, if you ever watch this video, uh, I'm gonna give you a qualified yes. When I was learning to drive, and I was learning to drive stick, my father had a very special car, which he left to me, and it had a delicate transmission, and not to say that this is delicate at all, but he didn't want me driving it until I could prove that I actually knew how to drive a stick shift well, and, and that's the gauntlet that I'm gonna put out for my kids. You wanna drive the R32, you're gonna to have to learn how to drive stick very well in one of our other cars, and then then you can come drive the car and that'll be fine. Um, but I plan to drive this the rest of my life. I love this car, it's fantastic. It's a lot of fun, it's utilitarian. I can fit my guitars in it, I can fold down the rear seats, use it as a sports hatchback. It just, it just does so many things. It's like the Swiss army knife of the Volkswagen world. And it's so sharp, it cuts. Uh, like Doug, Doug Markaita would say uh, in uh, Fortune Fire, your car will cut. Uh, and, and, and certainly I would think that if he was doing a car review of a car like the R32, I would love to hear him say, your car will handle. Your car will break. Your car will race. It will. It, it fits the bill. Your car will carry stuff. All right. You know, whatever. It's, it's a great car. I love this car. It's so much fun. And like I said, it's a smile machine. Every time I get in it, it's got to put a smile on my face. And speaking to some of the user experience, there are, there are some things you need to know about having a Mark IV R32. It's an aging car. As aging cars do, there are things that are going to wear out. If you've got more than 100,000 miles on your R32, chances are your fuel pump is not long for this world. And going out with your fuel pump is going to be your fuel pump relay. Replace them both at the same time. Don't go cheap, just get the factory part. It's not hard to replace. You can do it yourself at home. There are do-it-yourself tutorials. Actually, I think I wrote one of them. Oh, even the downshifting. It's just so good. Let's just enjoy the Wookiee noises for a moment. So good, so good. I love it. It's the best. Personal opinion, but I'm not wrong. Uh, back in the day when I had this early 2000s, you know, 2004, like I said, uh, this was a big target for all of the street racers and would be street racers who would see, go, oh, is it a real R32? I want to race it. And I'd have people pull up next to me on the freeway or on city streets wanting to stoplight race me. And, and, you know, if I'm being honest, back in those days, I gave into the temptation quite a bit. But even on just daily driving street stuff, I, I love it. It's got a great ride, great handling. It's predictable. It's forgiving. It gives you enough feedback, great noises, great braking. It's just a wonderful experience all around. 
And as far as the old car stuff goes, I was mentioning the fuel pump. I've replaced my fuel pump. Um, let's see, what else has actually broken in this car? Uh, the LED, I'm sorry, LCD display in the dash, that fritzed out, they all do. So I replaced it with the upgraded color screen. I've replaced just regular wear and tear stuff. Uh, you know, when the suspension, the shocks wore out, we replaced those. Replaced some bushings in the suspension a few times because, well, I've got, I've got 164,957 miles on my car right now. So I've put some miles on it. I've driven it across country a few times. I've tracked it. I've drag raced it. I'm still on the original clutch. I, I can't really complain about that. It's driving great. Feels like it's got a lot of life left on it. Um, there really hasn't been very much that's gone wrong. And that's a good thing compared to my Corrado, where I, you know, I modified the snot out of my G60 Corrado and it became the most unreliable thing on the planet. I went through seven superchargers in five years and they just explode like grenades and it was, it was challenging. And plus a lot of other things broke too, but this has been a really dead nuts, reliable car. And, and as it ages, I just take care of it, do the maintenance. Uh, it's getting to be time to do the timing chains. Now the chains on a VR6 can wear out at about 100 to 120,000 miles, or they can last a lot longer depending on your maintenance schedule. I have only kept Mobile One Zero W40 in this car since it was brand new, other than the original break-in oil change. And I changed the oil religiously. I changed the Haldex fluid in the all-wheel drive system. I stay up on the maintenance and it treats me well. There is no noise coming from the uh, the chains, and when I scan it on uh, on Vagcom or VCDS as they call it now, I'm not seeing enough wear and stretch in my chains to need to do them yet. So I haven't. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to really need to be done. And at that point, I'll probably put in cams, and I'll change my software to reflect the cams, and. Um, and I'll keep driving it. I love it. Naturally aspirated. It's perfection. It's wonderful. Having a great time. So anyway, if you have wondered about the R32, I hope that's a good overview for you. If you have any questions or comments, maybe you have an R32 you want to pipe in, please leave some comments. Um, I'm happy to respond to you. It's It's been a great time with this car, and I, I really enjoy it. And also let me know what you're working on. Do you have a project that you would just, you love and you want to share about? Post it. Do you have a video channel here on YouTube? Post it in my comments. I'd love to, to support you as a fellow car enthusiast. If you wouldn't mind checking out my Drive Tribe articles that I've written, head on over there. You can search for my name. I've written a few articles about various car experiences. I'd love for people to read my stuff. And of course, if you want to partner with me on Patreon and help sponsor me so that I can keep putting out great content, obviously this video didn't cost me anything more than a, a tank of gas to go drive around and, and enjoy my car, so not a great cost. But for many of the videos that we're doing, um, replacing parts, doing D DIY projects, how to do stuff at home, I want to provide that material for you. And hopefully you find it fun and encouraging and inspiring and at the very least mildly entertaining. But thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. And I'm going to just leave you with a few more happy Wookiee noises as I accelerate out of here. See ya. Oh, <laughs> I guess that's your uh, your perfect example of, of neck snapping acceleration from all wheel drive and, and just enough power if it knocks your GoPro mount over while you're accelerating. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next time. God bless. Please like, subscribe, share the video. You know the drill. It helps us out and it doesn't cost you a thing. See you soon. Bye-bye.